Welcome back to Flat Water, Flat Earth. The book is filled with all kinds of amazing items that we've seen before, that we've talked about before. Giants, giant mounds, artifacts, Bigfoot. The history of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians of Michigan. History of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians of Michigan and Grammar of Their Language by Andrew J. Blackbird, son of the Ottawa chief, Mock Ada Penasty. Entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1887 by Andrew J. Blackbird. Introduction. Andrew J. Blackbird, the author of this little book, is an educated Indian, son of the Ottawa chief. His Indian name is Mock Ada Benesi, Black Hawk, but he generally goes by the name of Blackbird, taken from the interpretation of the French L'Oiseau Noir. Mr. Blackbird's wife is an educated and intelligent white woman of English descent, and they have four children. He is a friend of the white people as well as of his own people. Brought up as an Indian with no opportunity for learning during his boyhood, when he came to think for himself, he started out blindly for an education, without any means but his brains and his hands. He was loyal to the government during the rebellion in the United States, for which cause he met much opposition by designing white people who had full sway among the Indians, and who tried to mislead them and cause them to be disloyal. And he broke up one or two rebellious councils amongst his people during the progress of the rebellion. When Honorable D.C. Leach of Traverse City, Michigan was Indian agent, Mr. Blackbird was appointed U.S. interpreter and continued in this office with other subsequent agents of the department for many years. Before he was fairly out of this office, he was appointed postmaster of Little Traverse, now Harbor Springs, and faithfully discharged his duties as such for over 11 years. He has also for several years looked after the soldiers' claims for widows and orphans, both for the whites as well as for his own people, in many instances without the least compensation, not even his stamps and paper paid. He is now decrepit with old age and failing health and unable to perform hard manual labor. We therefore recommend this work of Mr. A.J. Blackbird as interesting and reliable. Preface I deem it not improper to present the history of the last race of Indians now existing in the state of Michigan, called the Ottawa and Chippewa Nations of Indians. There were many other tribes of Indians in this region prior to the occupancy of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians of this state, who have long ago gone out of existence. Not a page of their history is on record, but only an allusion to them in our traditions. I have herewith recorded the earliest history of the Ottawa tribe of Indians in particular, according to their traditions. I have related where they formerly lived, the names of their leaders, and what tribes they contended with before and after they came to Michigan, and how they came to be the inhabitants of this state. Also, the earliest history of the island of Mackinac, and why it is called Machilla Mackinac, which name has never been correctly translated by white historians which is here given according to our knowledge of this matter long before we came in contact with white races. I have also recorded some of the most important legends, which resemble the Bible history, particularly the legends with regard to the Great Flood, which has been in our language for many centuries, and the legend of the great fish which swallowed the prophet Nana Boju, who came out again alive, which might be considered as corresponding to the story of Jonah in the sacred history. Beside my own personal and our family history, I have also quite extensively translated our language into English and added many other items which might be interesting to all who wish to inquire into our history and language. The Ypsilanti Auxiliary of the Women's National Indian Association, by whose efforts this book is published, take this opportunity to express earnest thanks to those who have aided in this work. Most generous donations of money from friends of Indians and equally valuable liberality from publishers and papermakers have made possible the preservation of this most rare and important history. This is the only instance where a native Indian has recorded the story of his people and given a grammar of their language, thus producing a work whose immense value as an account of a race and a language already passing into oblivion will become even more inestimable with the lapse of time. Ypsilanti, Michigan, October 1887. Chapter 1. History of the Ottawas of Michigan. Preliminary remarks in regard to other histories concerning the massacre of the old British fort on the Straits of Mackinac. British promise to the Ottawas. Ravages of smallpox. First recollection of the country of Arbor Croche and its definition. Uprightness and former character of the Indians. I have seen a number of writings by different men who attempted to give an account of the Indians who formerly occupied the Straits of Mackinac and Mackinac Island, that historic little island which stands at the entrance of the strait, also giving an account of the Indians who lived and are yet living in Michigan, scattered throughout the counties of Emmett, Sheboygan, Charlevoix, Antrim, Grand Traverse, and in the region of Thunder Bay, on the west shore of Lake Huron. But I see no very correct account of the Ottawa and Chippewa tribes of Indians, according to our knowledge of ourselves past and present. 
Many points are far from being credible. They are either misstated by persons who were not versed in the traditions of these Indians or exaggerated. An instance of this is found in the history of the life of Pontiac, pronounced Bwandiac, the Ojibwe or Chippewa chief of St. Clair, the instigator of the massacre of the old fort on the Straits of Mackinac, written by a noted historian. In his account of the massacre, he says there was at this time no known surviving Ottawa chief living on the south side of the Straits. This point of the history is incorrect, as there were several Ottawa chiefs living on the south side of the Straits at this particular time, who took no part in this massacre, but took by force the few survivors of this great disastrous catastrophe, and protected them for a while, and afterwards took them to Montreal, presenting them to the British government, at the same time praying that their brother Ojibwe should not be retaliated upon on account of their rash act against the British people but that they might be pardoned as this terrible tragedy was committed through mistake and through the evil counsel of one of their leaders by the name of Bwandiac, known in history as Pontiac. They told the British government that their brother Ojibwe's were few in number, while the British were in great numbers and daily increasing from an unknown part of the world across the ocean. They said, O oh my father, you are like the trees of the forest, and if one of the forest trees should be wounded with a hatchet, in a few years its wound will be entirely healed. Now my father, compare with this, this is what my brother Ojibwe did to some of your children on the streets of Mackinac, whose survivors we now bring back and present to your arms. O oh my father, have mercy upon my brothers and pardon them, for with your long arms and many, but a few strokes of retaliation would cause our brother to be entirely annihilated from the face of the earth. According to our understanding and our traditions, that was the time the British government made such extraordinary promises to the Ottawa tribe of Indians, at the same time thanking them for their humane action upon those British remnants of the massacre. She promised them that her long arms will perpetually extend around them from generation to generation, or so long as there should be rolling sun. They should receive gifts from her sovereign in shape of goods, provisions, firearms, ammunition, and intoxicating liquors. Her sovereign's beneficent arm should be even extended unto the dogs belonging to the Ottawa tribe of Indians. And what place soever she should meet them, she would freely unfasten the faucet which contains her living water, whiskey, which she will also cause to run perpetually and freely unto the Ottawas as the fountain of perpetual spring. And furthermore, she said, I am as many as the stars in the heavens, and when you get up in the morning, look to the east. You will see that the sun, as it will peep through the earth, will be as red as my coat, to remind you why I am likened unto the sun and my promises will be as perpetual as the rolling sun. Ego Mene, translated as corn hanger, was the head counselor and speaker of the Ottawa tribe of Indians. And according to our knowledge, Ego Mene was the leading one who went with those survivors of the massacre. He was the man who made the speech before the august assembly in the British Council Hall at Montreal at that time. Nesake, down the hill, the head chief of the Ottawa nation, did not go with the party, but sent his message and instructed their counselor in what manner he should appear before the British government. My father was a little boy at that time, and my grandfather and my great-grandfather were both living then, and both held the first royal rank among the Ottawas. My grandfather was then a sub-chief, and my great-grandfather was a war chief, whose name was Pungawish, and several other chiefs of the tribe I could mention who existed at that time. But this is ample evidence that the historian was mistaken in asserting that there was no known Ottawa chief existing at the time of the massacre. However, it was a notable fact that by this time the Ottawas were greatly reduced in numbers from what they were in former times, on account of the smallpox which they brought from Montreal during the French War with Great Britain. This smallpox was sold to them shut up in a tin box, with the strict injunction not to open the box on their way homeward, but only when they should reach their country, and that this box contained something that would do them great good and their people. The foolish people believed really there was something in the box supernatural that would do them great good. Accordingly, after they reached home, they opened the box, but behold, there was another tin box inside, smaller. They took it out and opened the second box, and behold, still, there was another box inside of the second box, smaller yet. So they kept on this way till they came to a very small box, which was not more than an inch long. And when they opened the last one, they found nothing but moldy particles in this last little box. They wondered very much what it was, and a great many closely inspected to try to find out what it meant. But alas, alas, pretty soon burst out a terrible sickness among them. The great Indian doctors themselves were taken sick and died. The tradition says it was indeed awful and terrible. Everyone taken with it was sure to die. Lodge after lodge was totally vacated, nothing but the dead bodies lying here and there in their lodges. Entire families being swept off with the ravages of this terrible disease. The whole coast of Arbor Croche, or Waga Nakaze, where their principal village was situated, on the west shore of the peninsula near the Straits, 
which is said to have been a continuous village some 15 or 16 miles long and extending from what is now called Cross Village to Seven Mile Point, that is seven miles from Little Traverse, now Harbor Springs, was entirely depopulated and laid waste. It is generally believed among the Indians of Arbor Croche that this wholesale murder of the Ottawas by this terrible disease sent by the British people was actuated through hatred and expressly to kill off the Ottawas and Chippewas because they were friends of the French government or French king, whom they called their great father. The reason that today we see no full-grown trees standing along the coast of Arbor Croche, a mile or more in width along the shore, is because the trees were entirely cleared away for this famous long village, which existed before the smallpox raged among the Ottawas. The word Arbor Croche is derived from two French words, Arbre, a tree, and Croche, something very crooked or hook-like. The tradition says when the Ottawas first came to that part of the country, a great pine tree stood very near the shore where Middle Village now is, whose top was very crooked, almost hook-like. Therefore the Ottawas called the place Waganakaze, meaning the crooked top of the tree. But by and by, the whole coast from Little Traverse to Tehingabeng, now Cross Village, became denominated as Waganakaze. In my first recollection of the country of Arbor Croche, which is 60 years ago, there was nothing but small shrubbery here and there in small patches, such as wild cherry trees. But the most of it was grassy plain. And such an ambition of wild strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries that they fairly perfumed the air of the whole coast with fragrant scent of ripe fruit. The wild pigeons and every variety of feathered songsters filled all the groves, warbling their songs joyfully and feasting upon these wild fruits of nature. And in these waters the fishes were so plentiful that as you lift up the anchor stone of your net in the morning, your net would be so loaded with delicious white fish as to fairly float with all its weight of the sinkers. As you look towards the course of your net, you see the fins of the fishes sticking out of the water in every way. Then I never knew my people to want for anything to eat or to wear, as we always had plenty of wild meat, plenty of fish, corn, vegetables, and wild fruits. I thought, and yet I may be mistaken, that my people were very happy in those days. At least I was as happy myself as a lark, or as the brown thrush that sat daily on the uppermost branches of the stubby growth of a basswood tree, which stood nearby upon the hill where we often played under its shade, lodging our little arrows among the thick branches of the tree and then shooting them down again for sport. Early in the morning as the sun peeped from the east, as I would yet be lying close to my mother's bosom, this brown thrush would begin his warbling songs perched upon the uppermost branches of the basswood tree that stood close to our lodge. I would then say to myself as I listened to him, here comes again my little orator, and I used to try to understand what he had to say, and sometimes thought I understood some of its utterances as follows. Good morning, good morning, arise, arise, shoot, shoot, come along, come along, etc. Every word repeated twice. Even then, and so young as I was, I used to think that little bird had a language which God, or the great spirit, had given him, and every bird of the forest understood what he had to say, and that he was appointed to preach to other birds, to tell them to be happy, to be thankful for the blessings they enjoy. Among the summer green branches of the forest, and the plenty of wild fruits to eat, the larger boys used to amuse themselves by playing a ball called Pakadoe, foot racing, wrestling, bow arrow shooting, and trying to beat one another, shooting the greatest number of chipmunks and squirrels in a day, etc. I never heard any boy or any grown person utter any bad language, even if they were out of patience with anything. Swearing or profanity was never heard among the Ottawa and Chippewa tribes of Indians, and not even found in their language. Scarcely any drunkenness. Only once in a great while the old folks used to have a kind of short spree particularly when there was any special occasion of a great feast going on. But all the young folks did not drink intoxicating liquors as a beverage in those days, and we always rested in perfect safety at night in our dwellings, and the doorways of our lodges had no fastenings to them, but simply a frail mat or a blanket was hung over our doorways, which might be easily pushed or thrown one side without any noise of theft or any other mischief was intended. But we were not afraid for any such thing to happen us, because we knew that every child of the forest was observing and living under the precepts which their forefathers taught them. And the children were taught almost daily by their parents from infancy unto manhood and womanhood, or until they were separated from their families. These precepts or moral commandments by which the Ottawa and Chippewa nations of Indians were governed in their primitive state were almost the same as the Ten Commandments which the God Almighty himself delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai on tables of stone. Very few of these divine precepts are not found among the precepts of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, except with regard to the Sabbath day to keep it holy, 
Almost every other commandment can be found, only there are more, as there were about 20 of these uncivilized precepts. They also believed in their primitive state, that the eye of this great being is the sun by day, and by night the moon and stars, and, therefore, that God or the great spirit sees all things everywhere, night and day, and it would be impossible to hide our actions, either good or bad, from the eye of this great being. Even the very threshold or crevice of your wigwam will be a witness against you if you should commit any criminal action when no human eye could observe your criminal doing. But surely your criminal actions will be revealed in some future time to your disgrace and shame. These were continual inculcations to the children by their parents. And in every feast and council by the instructors of the precepts to the people or to the audience of the council. For these reasons, the Ottawas and Chippewas, in their primitive state, were strictly honest and upright in their dealings with their fellow beings. Their word of promise was as good as a promissory note, even better, as these notes sometimes are neglected and not performed according to their promises. But the Indian promise was very sure and punctual, although, as they had no timepieces, they measured their time by the sun. If an Indian promised to execute a certain obligation at such time, at so many days and at such height of the sun, when that time comes he would be there punctually to fulfill this obligation. This was formerly the character of the Ottawa and Chippewa Indians of Michigan. But now our living is altogether different, as we are continually suffering under great anxiety and perplexity, and continually being robbed and cheated in various ways. Our houses have been forcibly entered for thieving purposes and murder. People have been knocked down and robbed. Great safes have been blown open with powder in our little town, and our contents carried away. And even children of the Caucasian race are heard cursing and blaspheming the name of their great creator upon whose pleasure we depended for our existence. According to my recollection of the mode of living in our village, so soon as darkness came in the evening, the young boys and girls were not allowed to be out of their lodges. Every one of them must be called into his own lodge for the rest of the night. And this rule of the Indians in their wild state was implicitly observed. Ottawa and Chippewa Indians were not what we would call entirely infidels and idolaters, for they believed that there is a supreme ruler of the universe the creator of all things, the great spirit, to which they offer worship and sacrifices in a certain form. It was customary among them, every spring of the year, to gather all the cast-off garments that had been worn during the winter, and rear them up on a long pole while they were having the festivals and jubilees to the great spirit. The object of doing this was that the great spirit might look down from heaven and have compassion on his red children. Only this, that they foolishly believe that there are certain deities all over the lands who to a certain extent govern or preside over certain places, as a deity who presides over this river, over this lake, or this mountain or island or country. And they were careful not to express anything which might displease such deities. But they were not supreme rulers, only to a certain extent they had power over the land where they presided. These deities were supposed to be governed by the great spirit above. Indians of Michigan, Chapter 2 Cases of murders among the Ottawas and Chippewas exceedingly scarce, ceding the Grand Traverse region to the Chippewas on account of murder. Immorality among the Ottawas not common. Marriage in former times. The murders in cold blood among the Ottawas and Chippewa nations of Indians in their primitive state were exceedingly few. At least there was only one account in our old tradition where a murder had been committed. A young Ottawa, having stabbed a young Chippewa while in dispute over their nets, while they were fishing for herrings on the Straits of Mackinac. This nearly caused a terrible bloody war between the two very powerful tribes of Indians, as they were so closely related and numerous then. The tradition says they had council after council upon this subject, and many speeches were delivered on both sides. The Chippewas proposed war to settle the question of murder, while the Ottawas proposed compromise and restitution for the murder. Finally, the Ottawas succeeded in settling the difficulty by ceding part of their country to the Chippewa Nation, which is now known and distinguished as the Grand Traverse region, a strip of land which I believe to have extended from a point near Sleeping Bear down to the eastern shore of the Grand Traverse Bay, some 30 or 40 miles wide, thence between two parallel lines running southeasterly until they strike the headwaters of Muskegon River, which empties into Lake Michigan not very far below Grand Haven. They were also allowed access to all the rivers and streams in the lower peninsula of Michigan, to trap the beavers, minks, otters, and muskrats. The Indians used their furs in former times for garments and blankets. This is the reason that to this day the Ojibwes, Chippewas, are found in that section of the country. It may be said this is not true, it is a mistake, 
We have known several cases of murders among the Ottawa and Chippewas. I admit it to be true that there have been cases of murders among the Ottawas and Chippewas since the white people knew them, but these cases of murders occurred some time after they came in contact with the white races in their country. But I am speaking now of the primitive condition of Indians, particularly of the Ottawas and Chippewas, and I believe most of those cases of murders were brought on through the bad influence of white men by introducing into the tribes this great destroyer of mankind, soul, and body, intoxicating liquors. Yet, during sixty years of my existence among the Ottawas and Chippewas, I have never witnessed one case of murder of this kind, but I heard there were a few cases in other parts of the country, when in their fury from the influence of intoxicating liquors. There was one case of sober murder happened about fifty years ago at Arbor Croche, where one young man disposed of his lover by killing, which no Indian ever knew the actual cause of. He was arrested and committed to the council, and tried according to the Indian style, and after a long council or trial it was determined the murderer should be banished from the tribe, therefore he was banished. Also about this time one case of sober murder transpired among the Chippewas of Sault Ste. Marie, committed by one of the young Chippewas whose name was Waba Nimike, White Thunder, who might have been released if he had been properly tried and impartial judgment exercised over the case but we believe it was not. This Indian killed a white man when he was perfectly sober by stabbing. He was arrested, of course, and tried and sentenced to be hung at the island of Mackinac. I distinctly remember the time. This poor Indian was very happy when he was about to be hung on the gallows. He told the people that he was very happy to die, for he felt that he was innocent. He did not deny killing the man, but he thought he was justifiable in the sight of the Great Spirit, as such wicked monsters ought to be killed from off the earth. As this white man came to the Indian's wigwam in the dead of night and dragged the mother of his children from his very bosom for licentious purpose, he remonstrated, but his remonstrances were not heeded, as this ruffian was encouraged by others who stood around his wigwam and ready to fall upon this poor Indian and help their fellow ruffian, and he therefore stabbed the principal party in defense of his beloved wife, for which cause the white man died. If an Indian should go to the white man's house and commit that crime, he would be killed. And what man is there who would say that is too bad, this Indian to be killed in that manner? But every man will say amen, only he ought to have been tortured before he was killed, and let the man who killed this bad and wicked Indian be rewarded. This is what would be the result if the Indian would have done the same thing as this white man did. The Ottawas and Chippewas were quite virtuous in their primitive state, as there were no illegitimate children reported in our old tradition. But very lately this evil came to exist among the Ottawas, and from that time this evil came to be quite frequent, for immorality has been introduced among these people by evil white persons who bring their vices into the tribes. In the former times, or before the Indians were Christianized, when a young man came to be a fit age to get married, he did not trouble himself about what girl he should have for his wife, but the parents of the young man did this part of the business. When the parents thought best that their son should be separated from their family by marriage, it was their business to decide what woman their son should have as his wife and after selecting some particular girl among their neighbors, they would make up quite large package of presents, and then go to the parents of the girl and demand the daughter for their son's wife, at the same time delivering the presents to the parents of the girl. If the old folks say yes, then they would fetch the girl right along to their son and tell him, we have brought this girl as your wife so long as you live. Now take her, cherish her, and be kind to her so long as you live. The young man and girl did not dare to say aught against it, as it was the law and custom among their people. But all they had to do was take each other as man and wife. This was all the rules and ceremony of getting married in former times, among the Ottawas and Chippewas of Michigan. They must not marry their cousins nor second cousins. Chapter 3. Earliest possible known history of Mackinac Island. Its historical definition. Who resided at the island. Massacre at the island by Senecas, where the Ottawas were living at that time only two escaped the massacre, what became of them, the legends of the two who escaped, occupants of the island afterwards, who killed warrior Tecumseh. Again, most every historian or analyst, so-called, who writes about the island of Mackinac and the straits and vicinity, tells us that the definition or the meaning of the word Michilla Mackinac in the Ottawa and Chippewa language is large turtle, derived from the word Mishimikinak in the Chippewa language, that is Mishi, as one of the adnominals or adjectives in the Ottawa and Chippewa languages, which would signify tremendous in size, and Mikinok is the name of mud turtle, meaning therefore 
monstrous large turtle, as the historians would have it. But we consider this to be a clear error. Wherever those analysts or those who write about the island of Mackinac obtain their information as to the definition of the word Machilla Mackinac, I don't know. When our tradition is so direct and so clear with regard to the historical definition of that word, and is far from being derived from the word Michimikinok, as the historians have told us. Our tradition says that when the island was first discovered by the Ottawas, which was some time before America was known as an existing country by the white man, there was a small independent tribe, a remnant race of Indians who occupied this island, who became confederated with the Ottawas when the Ottawas were living at Manitoulin, formerly called Ottawa Island, which is situated north of Lake Huron. The Ottawas thought a good deal of this unfortunate race of people, as they were kind of interesting sort of people. But unfortunately, they had most powerful enemies who every now and then would come among them to make war with them. Their enemies were of the Iroquois of New York. Therefore, once in the dead of the winter, while the Ottawas were having a great jubilee and war dances at their island, now Manitoulin on account of the great conquest over the Winnebago's of Wisconsin, of which I will speak more fully in subsequent chapters, during which time the Senecas of New York of the Iroquois family of Indians came upon the remnant race and fought them, and almost entirely annihilated them. But two escaped to tell the story, who effected their escape by flight, and by hiding in one of the natural caves of the island. And therefore that was the end of this race. And according to our understanding and traditions, the tribal name of those disastrous people was Mishinamakinago, which is still existing to this day as a monument of their former existence. For the Ottawas and Chippewas named this little island Mishinamakinam, for memorial sake of those, their former confederates, which word is the locative case of the Indian noun Michinamakinago. Therefore, we contend this is properly where the name Michilamakinac is originated. This is the earliest possible history of this little island, as I have related. According to the Ottawa traditions, and from that time forward, there have been many changes in its history as other tribes of Indians took possession of the island, such as the Hurons and Chippewas, and still later by the Whites, French, English, and Americans. And numbers of battles have been fought from time to time there by both Indians and Whites, of which I need not relate as other historians have already given us the accounts of them. But only this I would relate because I have never yet seen the account of it. It is related in our traditions that at the time when the Chippewas occupied the island, they ceded it to the United States government, but reserved a strip of land all around the island as far as a stone throw from its water's edge as their encampment grounds when they might come to the island to trade or for other business. Perhaps the reader would like to know what became of those two persons who escaped from the lamented tribe Machinamakinagos. I will here give it just as it is related in our traditions, although this may be considered at this age as a fictitious story, but every Ottawa and Chippewa to this day believes it to be positively so. It is related that the two persons escaped were two young people, male and female, and they were lovers. After everything got quieted down, they fixed their snowshoes inverted and crossed the lake on the ice, as snow was quite deep on the ice, and they went towards the north shore of Lake Huron. The object of inverting their snowshoes was that, in case any person should happen to come across their track on the ice, their track would appear as if going towards the island. They became so disgusted with human nature, it is related, that they shunned every mortal being, and just lived by themselves, selecting the wildest part of the country. Therefore the Ottawas and Chippewas called them Pagwa Cha Nishnaboy. The last time they were seen by the Ottawas, they had ten children, all boys, and all living and well. And every Ottawa and Chippewa believes to this day that they are still in existence and roaming in the wildest part of the land, but as supernatural beings. That is, they can be seen or unseen, just as they see fit to be. And sometimes they simply manifested themselves as being present by throwing a club or a stone at a person walking in solitude, or by striking a dog belonging to the person walking. And sometimes by throwing a club at the lodge night or day, or hearing their footsteps walking around the wigwam when the Indians would be camping out in an unsettled part of the country, and the dogs would bark, just as they would bark at any strange person approaching the door. And sometimes they would be tracked on snow by hunters, and if followed on their track, however recently passed, they could never be overtaken. Sometimes when an Indian would be hunting or walking in solitude, he would suddenly be seized with an unearthly fright, terribly awe-stricken, apprehending some great evil. He feels very peculiar sensation from head to foot. The hair of his head standing and feeling stiff like a porcupine quill. He feels almost benumbed with fright, and yet he does not know what it is. In looking in every direction to see something, but nothing to be seen which might cause sensation of terror. Collecting himself, he would then say, Pshaw, it's nothing here to be afraid of. 
It's nobody else but Paga Cha Nishnaboy is approaching me. Perhaps he wanted something of me. They would then leave something on their tracks, tobacco, powder, or something else. Once in a great while they would appear and approach the person to talk with him. And in this case, it is said, they would always begin with the sad story of their great catastrophe at the island of Mackinac. And whoever would be so fortunate as to meet and see them to talk with them, such person would always become a prophet to his people, either Ottawa or Chippewa. Therefore, Ottawas and Chippewas called these supernatural beings Pogwa Cha Nishnaboy, which is strictly wild roaming supernatural being. Pine River County in Charlevoix County, Michigan, when this country was all wild, especially near Pine Lake, was once considered as the most famous resort of these kind of unnatural beings. I was once conversing with one of the first white settlers of that portion of the country, who settled near to the place now called Boyne City, at the extreme end of the east arm of Pine Lake. In the conversation, he told me that many times they had been frightened, particularly during the nights, by hearing what sounded like human footsteps around outside of their cabin and their dog would be terrified, crouching at the doorway, snarling and growling and sometimes fearfully barking. When daylight came, the old man would go out in order to discover what it was or if he could track anything around his cabin. But he never could discover a track of any kind. These remarkable, mischievous, audible, fanciful, appalling apprehensions were a very frequent occurrence before any other inhabitants or settlers came near to his place. But now they do not have such apprehension since many settlers came. That massacre of Michinimackinagos by Seneca Indians of New York happened probably more than five or six hundred years ago. I could say much more, which would be contradictory of other writers of the history of the Indians in this country. Even in the history of the United States, I think there are some mistakes concerning the accounts of the Indians, particularly the accounts of our brave Tecumseh, as it is claimed that he was killed by a soldier named Johnson upon whom they conferred the honor of having disposed of the dreaded Tecumseh, even pictured out as being coming up with his tomahawk to strike a man who was on horseback, but being instantly shot dead with the pistol. Now I have repeatedly heard our oldest Indians, both male and female, who were present at the defeat of the British and Indians, all tell a unanimous story, saying that they came to a clearing or opening spot, and it was there where Tecumseh ordered his warriors to rally and fight the Americans once more. And in this very spot, one of the American musket balls took effect in Tecumseh's leg, so as to break the bone of his leg, that he could not stand up. He was sitting on the ground when he told his warriors to flee as well as they could, and furthermore said, One of my leg is shot off, but leave me one or two guns loaded, I am going to have a last shot. Be quick and go. That was the last word spoken by Tecumseh. As they looked back, they saw the soldiers thick as swarm of bees around where Tecumseh was sitting on the ground with his broken leg. And so they did not see him anymore. And therefore, we always believe that the Indians or Americans know not who made the fatal shot in Tecumseh's leg, or what the soldiers did with him when they came up to him as he was sitting on the ground. Chapter 4 The author's reasons for recording the history of his people and their language. History of his nationality. A sketch of his father's history how the Indians were treated in Manitoba country 100 years ago, his father's banishment to die on a lonely island by the white traders, second misfortune of the Ottawas on account of the Shawanee prophet, the earthquake. The Indian tribes are continually diminishing on the face of this continent. Some have already passed entirely out of existence and are forgotten, who once inhabited this part of the country, such as the Mashkadesh, Urans, Osages, who formerly occupied Saginaw Bay, and the Odagamis, whose principal habitation was about the vicinity of Detroit River. They are entirely vanished into nothingness. Not a single page of their history can be found on record in the history of this country, or hardly an allusion to their existence.
Blackstone girl. And here at the jump, they're also going around. In the meantime, we're ready to go. We'll turn it over to Sharpshooter. Let's get them dancing.